So this begins the second part of the lesson on Islamic art. With this uh, part of the lesson, let's just take a quick look at the elements of architecture arches. You can get more on this by going to page 274 in your textbook. I, and I just wanted to look at them here because it's interesting to look at the four kinds together and to become familiar with the shapes of each kind of arch so that you can possibly recognize them in art and architecture. In my mind, the second one from the left, the horseshoe arch, is the one that most represents Islamic architecture. Now let's talk about pulpits, shall we? Oh, but they're not called pulpits, they're called minbars in Islam. Now these, that's where the, basically where the, the imam or the preacher stands to address the crowd and to give a teaching. Now, this is an interesting one in that it's in a museum and it's really out of context. But as we learned earlier, this started from a tradition of uh, Muhammad standing on a low platform as he spoke to his followers in the courtyard of his home. And it has become an ever more elaborate feature in the mosque. This one is from Marrakesh, Morocco. And if you look closely, you can see the beautiful inlay of wood and ivory on the outside of it. What I love about this kind of architecture, I mean this kind of a motif, is just the patterning and the way that so many different geometric shapes will come into view as you stare more and more. As the longer you stare at the patterns, the more different shapes and relationships that you'll see. And it actually takes a mathematical mind to figure this out. I took a course once called Sacred Geometry, and this is called tess Tesserary or Tiling that would be creating these patterns that we see in Islamic architecture and art. And it's very mathematical, um, very interesting for an artist to take that on. <laughs> I'll say it was a challenge. Now calligraphy was very important to early Islam. It is actually still an important art form to this day. Much as we saw with the medieval monks who would transcribe the Bible word by word, there were people in uh, Islamic society who did the same thing. And this is an early page from the Quran. An interesting thing about Islamic script is that it has many different styles. This is one style that's called the Kufic style. And it's noteworthy because it's sort of blocky and very easy for a lot of people to read. Often these books would just have four or five lines of type on the page because they're designed to be read by many people gathered around. Now one interesting note, first it's got gold at the bottom, that's kind of interesting, but if you can see these little red dots, they're actually pronunciation guides. Now another thing that's interesting is that in Islamic cultures people read from the right to the left, so it's opposite of how we read. Now just for fun, I've included some modern day examples of Islamic art calligraphy. There's, that's a big movement now, and I'm not exactly sure what this says, but it seems like it might have something to do with a heart. Here's a painting using the calligraphy. And again, this is, if, you, if I read um, Arabic or Farsi, then I would be able to clearly read what this said. And it's become a very high art form. Now let's go back in history and look at a plate. Here's another way that uh, the calligraphy was used to decorate a plate. And again, it's the same Kufic script, which means a style of writing. And let's see, this is a plate. If you think about it, it's a ceramic plate. And it, you know, it's lasted, well, let's see, oh, about 1,200 years. So I'd say it's a pretty lucky plate not to have been dropped in all that time. Another of the high arts of the early Islamic artisans was this glazed earthenware or pottery. They would actually use um, powdered precious stones like lapis um, or maybe malachite to create the glazes that they used to, create, to paint on these vases. Okay, so now let's look a little bit more at the art in context. Here we have the great mosque uh, madrasa mausoleum complex in Cairo. And here we have in the front, we have the minbar, which is the place where the guy stands to make his sermon. 
And in the back, you can see the, what they call the mirab. The mirab shows the direction to go to pray towards Mecca. So if you see that sort of double arch, it's a horseshoe arch, uh, to the left side in the background, that's the mirab. Now, when we look at terminology, it's interesting to look at the word madrasa because it has such connotations today. But if you were to translate it literally, it means school. So it's basically a school that has some religious overtones. However, that's maybe been used by extremists today so that the word madrasa seems like it's a training ground for terrorists. But that's really not the original meaning of the word. And there's um, a large, the vast majority of madrasas simply teach people in school, you know, the regular subjects with some religious overtones. In addition to building mosques, early Muslims did build grand palaces, and one of the grandest of all that survives is in southern Spain, in Grenada. This is in the actual the outpost of Alhambra, which is up above the valley of Grenada. And, and this is what we call the Court of the Lions. And if you look closely, the water feature at the center is held up by, guess what? Lions! Oh, but this is such a beautiful palace. In fact, there's a video of Lorena McKennett playing music at Alhambra, and there's a lot of footage of her walking through the palace. And that's one of our videos for the week. If you want to get a feel of this place, that's the one to watch. But let's also look at the uh, stalactite features in the next slide. Here we have also from Alhambra a Mukarna dome. Now we looked at that technique early on at the beginning of the first lecture. And here we have, it's almost like Hagia Sophia in that the windows go around under the dome and create a feeling that it's floating on light. But it also gives me the feeling of being almost in a cave as there's all those little um, sort of stalactite. They're like stalactites, but they have more form and more regularity as would a honeycomb. And I, I just find this incredibly beautiful. And it's also from the Palace of the Lions in Alhambra in Spain. The, or, the arts of the early Muslims are so varied and so rich that we can only touch on a little bit of that here. But this is an inlaid silver and gold bowl, which, interestingly enough, is called the Baptistry of St. Louis. And it's actually, it was created by a Muslim artisan but then it was taken by the French and was used as a baptismal bowl. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but at some point after it was made. I think around the year 1400. Now, if you look in your book, you can look more closely at the intricate metalwork and patterning that was done on this truly beautiful vessel. Now let's take a little look at the art of the book. In early Islam, literacy was strongly encouraged for both men and for women. Um, in fact, the suppression of women didn't come until much later. But as we see here, these books do resemble the illuminated manuscripts that we saw in the Celtic tradition. Now these books were, um, once paper became available, I think that was in about 1300, then uh, there was a ver wide variety of books that were produced. They were both on secular subjects and uh, copies of the Quran and other religious texts. These were usually collected in libraries that were associated with the madrasas, but they were also collected by royal patrons who would get the most sumptuous and luxurious books. Now if you look at this one and you see that it, it might resemble a Persian carpet, that's no accident. Often the same artists actually created the designs for both of them and then artisans would execute the designs. So this is a cover of a book created in a place called Mumluk in Egypt and that was uh, a great center for the making of the book arts. Another thing that we see in the early books is what is sometimes known as Persian miniature painting. And these are these small paintings that would be commissioned by wealthy patrons and included in the book. They're very specific, very detailed, and it took a, a lot of training and expertise to create these Persian miniature paintings. Now, as we continue our journey through the history of Islam, 
we'll talk about gunpowder. Now, throughout this time, there was fighting amongst small tribal units, but when gunpowder was introduced, it changed everything. No longer could a lord isolate himself, in, uh, you know, in his, in his castle or in his compound if he didn't have access to gunpowder. There was no defense. So instead, this is when cities began to develop more strongly. And really the Islamic world, world split into three main groups. We're going to talk primarily here about the Ottoman and the Safavid. Now the Ottoman Empire is pretty amazing because it, they ruled from the 1300s until 1918. And this is when we hear of the sultans and the harem and all that. That was really in the Ottoman Empire. Now we're looking at the mosque of the Sultan Selim in western Turkey. And if you remember Hagia Sophia, it's very central. It's very uh, similar in its architectural layout as that great masterpiece. Now another thing that happened with the takeover of the Ottomans, with the Ottomans taking over Turkey, in particular Constantinople, they changed its name to Istanbul and the Eastern Byzantine Empire basically crumbled at that point. So here's a peek inside the mosque and you can see the little bitty black specks are people. So that's how big it is. And it's quite elegant, and it, ha it does exhibit a slightly different style that we saw in the other architectural uh, uh, buildings, that th that, like we saw, just like the Dome of the Rock, which was a little bit busier in the interior. And this one has a little bit more refinement of form and is a, a little bit easier to look at, really. So we're going to briefly take a look at mosaic again. This is called the Baghdad Kiosk alcove, and what's notable here is the intricate tile work. This, in fact, is the hideaway of the Sultan. This is his own private space, and the Sultan would be like the king or the ruler, and at the very center of the palace was his retreat, and that's what we're looking at here. While we've been talking about the Ottoman Empire, let's talk for a moment about the Safavid uh, Empire or the group of the Safavids. They were primarily Shia Muslims and they covered the area more in Iran and some of Iraq. And with the Safavids, we have some of the finest book arts of all times. In fact, this is considered to be one of the greatest examples of the Persian manuscript painting. And it's a little bit hard to see, but you can find it on page 289 in your textbook. And I invite you to look closely at this incredible work of art. It was one of 750 pages, 289 illustrations, and it's set with gold all around the edges. Here we have the mo great mosque in the city of Isfahan in Iran. Now, Isfahan is still seen as a great center of learning and it was settled as a capital in the Safavid Empire. One of the things to notice here is the repetition of arches and the difference in style than what we see in the Byzantine architecture. So now to sum up, or to, to finish our lecture, we're going to talk about carpet making. Persian carpets is one of the most widely known art forms for people in the West. In fact, in the 17th and 18th century, Islamic or Persian carpets were highly prized and were rarely put on the floor. The same is true to this day where people will often hang them on the walls. Now these carpets had a very practical purpose. In Islamic prayer the carpet is used to kneel and a bow, but also in that society there's not that much furniture. Most of the, of the eating of meals, of sleeping, happens on mats and cushions on the floor. So in this society, you simply leave your shoes at the door, and the carpet is an integral part of daily life. So let's look at a few of the techniques that they may have used to create the carpets. You can find out, see these more closely if you look at page 292 in the textbook, but you see there's three specific patterns that are presented here. So maybe looking at all these different weaves and warps and woofs will help to bring together uh, the warp and woof of the variety of cultures that we see throughout the planet and hope, I hope that this little taste of Islamic culture has enlightened and widened your view of this incredibly diverse and rich society.
Thanks for listening.